Hey everybody, uh, my name is David Zarnecki, and thanks for sticking around here for the last session at Ruby Midwest. I think by virtue of the title of my talk, I was probably uh, destined to have the last slot here. Uh, so if I ever reprise this talk, I'm going to have to certainly change the title uh, so I can go up first. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Ruby and Rails and, and how we use that in the game industry and some of the challenges that we faced in making that work well. Uh, before I get started, uh, like we've thanked all the, the presenters for coming up here, but uh, uh, I'd really like to, if we could all give a round of applause to the organizers on the side. a great conference. You can find me on Twitter at ZarneckyD if you're interested in video games or Ruby. I take pictures of a lot of food. Sometimes I Twitter about beekeeping. If you're interested in those things, then uh, uh, follow me, but uh, don't be obliged because I'm up here talking words at you. Uh, I work for a company called Allure Games. We are in upstate New York, basically two and a half hours direct north of New York City. We got our start developing community sites for video games, uh, whether it be a handheld uh, DS title like Transformers or Transformers 2, uh, all the way up to console titles uh, on the Xbox and PS3. And we also have a middleware product that we develop that game companies can integrate into their games to pull data out of games. We do interesting stuff with it, and then we can feed that back to the game. We can feed that back to a community site, uh, to the web, to a, a mobile device. Uh, right now, our middleware platform is Python-based, but really the, the ideas <coughs> and genesis in the work uh, came out of all the Ruby and Rails uh, that we were doing and still continues to this day for, for certain titles. So we've worked with uh, titles you may have heard of, uh, Call of Duty, World at War. Uh, this year we worked on Brink, uh, Mortal Kombat, Batman Arkham City. So you've got the uh, Batman sticker on your laptop. And We've been involved with the entire Guitar Hero franchise since, uh, since the beginning. Uh, so again, many of the ideas that I'm going to talk about are kind of born out of what we had to do to scale Ruby, to scale uh, Rails, the services that we have, and scale our infrastructure. Unfortunately, this isn't one of the titles that we work on, but I'd really, at some point, like to get in contact with uh, the, the folks uh, at Cabela to, to work on their the, the Safari series, and, and not just because it's uh, the, the meme of, of, of the Ruby Midwest conference. We're also a part of Major League Gaming. If you are into competitive gaming, uh, competitive StarCraft, competitive Halo 3, Halo Reach, then you may know MLG as the MLB or NHL or NFL of eSports. And we handle all the development for their online properties like MLG TV, game battles, where you can go online and compete against uh, other gamers and all their, all their live events. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the data that we're handling and, and that's going through our network, 60 million plus players across the, the different titles uh, that we work with. In 2011, 1.3 petabytes of data, and we'll probably be somewhere close to, I, I think, two by the, by the end of the year, uh, as, as numbers go. Kind of an interesting little Twitter bite here. We talk, talks directly to our rail stack for all of the Guitar Hero titles uh, less than Guitar Hero 5. So Guitar Hero 3, Guitar Hero Van Halen, if you're playing on the Wii, you are talking when the, you finish a song or when you want to get the game code to link uh, your game, your account in your game to the community site. 
all that's talking directly to uh, our Rails infrastructure. So kind of awesome, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, we get to uh, we get to write Rails and then uh, in, in some small way really shape the way the online experience happens for uh, a major title and, and a major console. So one of the problems that that we uh, ran up against was you know, scaling scaling rails and I think the the approach that uh, I took in this talk which was a little, quite a bit different from uh, maybe a similar talk that I had given two years ago at uh, RailsConf was to talk about a few problem areas and really talk about our approach uh, of how we of how we went about uh, working with different services or working with large amounts of data and hopefully you'll be able to extrapolate the ideas that are presented in the talk and use those uh, to to come up with solutions or approaches for your applications because quite honestly every application every code base is different so the needs that you're going to have in terms of scaling are not necessarily going to be the the same that uh, that we have so let's tackle the easy stuff right uh, you should uh, Google right now if the internet is working for you Google for Ola Beanie uh, just add scaling so it was a it was a really great blog post a couple of years ago that, that he wrote uh, about the fact that scaling isn't present in any language so you can't look at the bytecode for Java uh, or uh, what gets generated uh, in in the Ruby standard libraries, there's not a module that you can add. So I'm going to add the scaling module, and all of a sudden, my my Ruby's magically going to work faster, better, harder, stronger. Uh, it, it's it's just not a thing. So we have to be smarter about uh, how we approach scaling. For us in the video game industry, it'd probably be okay if. Uh, you know, we could cancel all of the major holidays if kids were in school every day of the year, if uh, we didn't launch titles at all. But quite honestly, that's not the case. People never stop playing video games. Data is always coming in. So uh, just to kind of drive home the point of Christmas being canceled, here is a quote from our CEO. After Guitar Hero 3's launch and the associated influx of data that was burying us, I remember telling a random person that had just bought Guitar Hero 3 at GameStop not to go online. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do that, okay? That is, that is not within the realm of possibilities. People are going to play a game. People are going to want to use your site. So I think the point that I want to drive home with this slide is when your company may go under, when your product uh, is not having a successful launch, you are going to find the solution to scaling your systems that works for you. And guess what? That's fine because uh, you haven't, you have necessarily done it the, the wrong way. Uh, again, uh, hopefully, with some of what I'm going to talk about here, uh, you'll be able to take the approaches and apply those to your challenges. So I'll talk a little bit about process, not, not too much, because I don't want to inundate you uh, with that. So the problem is we need some process for how we go about developing our software. And it's nice if you can actually start with nothing and then build up to add in the processes that work for your organization, whether it be stand-ups or uh, how you do uh, flow in development, like GitHub flow, uh, wh whatever it is. These are just a few that I've picked out that have kind of worked for, for our team. So I like to do things early. When I deploy, I like to deploy early in the day. I like to deploy early in the week. When we were launching Guitar Hero Aerosmith, and when we launched Guitar Hero World Tour, Activision wanted to do midnight launches on the weekend. 
that sucks. Because you're up all day kind of getting ready for the launch, and then you have to launch. It happens at midnight, you click the button, you deploy, make sure all your servers are in order. And then you're up for another two or three hours fixing whatever issues uh, may have come up from, from actually launching. So if you can, it's nice to be able to uh, launch, launch early so that uh, um, you can fix bugs uh, or do whatever, make whatever change you need to make with the clear head. I can't stress enough the, uh, that documentation always uh, is key to any large project. Uh, Guitar Hero as a Rails application is a single application that handles all of the Guitar Hero titles. And after, or starting with Guitar Hero Metallica, I really made a concerted effort to codify that into a document. So it lives in our, our version control. And it's called Creating a New Guitar Hero Title.txt. And it's about 13 or 14 steps uh, of all the things that you need to do to the code base to, to bring in a new Guitar Hero title. So it was great because for Guitar Hero Greatest Hits, for Van Halen, for Van Hero, and for Guitar Hero 5, I just followed the steps in that document. And usually what it was, was I got an Excel spreadsheet from uh, the developer of the game, sometimes uh, Activision itself, uh, to say, hey, these are the 96 songs that are going to be in Guitar Hero 5. Did a little munging of the data, get it into our configuration files, and usually by the end of the day, I had the, the title ready on staging to be able to uh, uh, play one of the, the builds of the game and be able to see stats being collected from the game. And so, Anybody in the organization <coughs> could use that document and basically do, do what I did. For us, a lot of what we were doing with uh, community sites, uh, and I guess the, the web in general, is that web applications are never done, right? Uh, a new browser comes out, uh, there may be incompat incompatibilities with the latest release of Firefox, so you're constantly making changes to uh, to your software, and it's easier for us as uh, a middleware provider or uh, as web developers to to make those changes. It's very costly uh, for games to do title updates. Uh, there's actually a bit of code in the Guitar Hero application for Guitar Hero World Tour. Uh, we interface with the third party for for doing leaderboards on the PS3 and 360. And uh, the identifier in the database for pulling out the song for Living on a Prayer is different from the song identifier that we get from the game. Uh, so we have to kind of do a little data munging uh, in the application to actually make that work. And it's cheap for us because it's uh, a couple of lines to to change the, the identifier around, that would probably cost tens of thousands of dollars for a game developer to uh, go through QA, go through recertification, push out the patch to, uh, to the world and make that available. Uh, so as web developers, uh, we can be more smart and have to fix problems for, for other folks. I definitely find that employing uh, overhead, this is uh, our VP of production, and uh, they, they provide just a, a valid uh, role as developers uh, do in the organization, just as designers do in the organization, and that they are managing the client. Uh, I could spend uh, part of my day uh, working with the client, uh, kind of interacting with them, but you know, that's, that's their forte, that's their expertise, and uh, um, so having them around is just as uh, valuable as the, as the work that, that I do. Talk a little bit about game integration. Uh, we get a lot of data 
all of the time, as as you can, as you may have seen from the numbers that that I that I displayed before. So, how do we process that data? Because we have to process it all the time. Uh, in 2008, when Guitar Hero World Tour launched in the fall, most people didn't end up buying the game or waited to buy the game uh, until Christmas uh, because it was like a $200 bundle to actually buy it. So on Christmas Day, uh, our systems crashed and burned uh, because of the way that, that we were uh, handling data. And I remember driving back from uh, my parents. I would headed back home a couple hours north uh, upstate and got back, saw that the systems were basically not doing anything and uh, spent the entire night getting to a nominal state so that we could, uh, that we could move forward. And uh, that wasn't fun. So uh, we had to re-engineer our approach uh, for starting with Guitar Hero Metallica to take what we were doing uh, in this weird, uh, this weird threading and forking and collecting threads and sending them to the application server and doing this weird data processing. So we got smart, and it's like uh, 2009, and there are things uh, like queues that we can use to basically shunt all the data processing and actually have uh, a pipeline for the different games to uh, to be able to take data uh, from from the game and have workers that will uh, turn through that all the time. Uh, Guitar Hero has been running with uh, Sparrow. Uh, it's an old queuing system that's that uses memcache. Uh, we built a simple controller that. Uh, allows us to monitor the events. You're probably using Rescue right now to do job processing. We use that now as well. We got smarter because it's awesome. Uh, but why is it awesome? Rescue Web. You have a view into uh, what is happening in your system. And the, the more you can monitor and measure things in your system, uh, the better you are uh, to be able to handle and know what you're going to need to optimize for. Uh, so, what do we optimize around? We have to optimize optimize around school vacations, uh, so the summer, uh, obviously uh, Christmas, obviously we can't cancel uh, those holidays, so we need to uh, we need to do what we can to um, be as uh, performant uh, during those those times when we're going to see more data. I'd like to think that all uh, cues are equal, but really they're not. Uh, what we found is that when a new game comes out, people are always playing the new hotness. So we will throw more processing power when a game launches to process all the data for the latest title, uh, because people are not going to be playing the, the older games. One big problem that we have is, uh, is leaderboards. Uh, I remember interviewing and uh, uh, getting asked, uh, you know, how would you implement uh, leaderboards? And so one approach that we used for quite a while was MySQL. And that will take you so far if you have a few thousand scores that, that you need to collect. But obviously for all the titles for, you know, a game like Guitar Hero, we have uh, seven different titles or eight different titles, I think it is, and then uh, every single song in the game, and then for games that have the separate instruments, you've got to keep all those. So it's just a, a morass of, of data, and uh, you know, like what, what's happening in, in, in the picture there, the, the MySQL leaderboard code that we have, to look at it, I just want to shoot myself in the head because it's so convoluted. Uh, so, short interlude, it was this past year on uh, New Year's, I went out to dinner and uh, uh, decided to take a cab and when I got done with uh, dinner after midnight, called the cab company and tried to get a cab uh, on New Year's, like not going to happen. So they said call the, the free ride, uh, so free ride, free ride 
It's like, yeah, we'll take you back home, that's fine. And I ended up riding the short bus back home uh, on New Year's. And I woke up and I was like, it's 2011 now and we don't have flying cars and I just rode the short bus home uh, from dinner, so I'm gonna make something awesome for the universe. <laughs> so, uh, so leaderboard is, uh, is, is using Redis sorted sets to, to do leaderboards and, and we kind of migrated uh, our infrastructure to, to, use, to use that. Um, those two images were from uh, Cobra, probably the greatest alone movie ever made. Uh, it's, it, I mean, we, we can argue that after uh, at, at bowling, but uh, it really is. So external services. Problem is we need to integrate with third party data services. So how, how do we do that uh, well? And, and how do we do that internally? So we can use brute force. Uh, we can force ourselves to be performant. So uh, we cap our uh, unicorn requests at 30 seconds. 30 seconds is, is a long time for requests to uh, be uh, to be happening in, in your application. Uh, so if a request is going to take uh, more than 30 seconds, find a way to get that data back to the client, back to the web in an asynchronous fashion. Um, because you're just going to kill yourself uh, and you're not going to have ever enough processing power if you just let requests run on and on without uh, imposing some, some limits on, on their execution. Timeouts. Uh, Beginning of this year, we launched uh, a site for MLG called My MLG. It was basically like uh, Facebook, but for MLG, where you could uh, go and give your status. We we would post status from game battles. Hey, this person just won a match. So when we launched, uh, I couldn't keep the site up for uh, more than a second or two, or or at all. And it turns out. Uh, game battles that we talked to to actually render some of the, the information on the page was being DDoSed. And so when I went and talked to one of our production folks at uh, about four in the afternoon, he's like, oh, game battles is being DDoSed. Oh, I would have liked to have known that at 9 a.m. as uh, the site was crashing and burning. So if you can, uh, impose uh, the constraints on actually talking to services. So. I think the default when you are using uh, like NetHTTP uh, to talk to a service is like 60 seconds, way too much time. Start with something like 10 seconds and slowly ramp back uh, and see you know, what, is the, what you need to do to, um, uh, to not kill your systems. Obviously, caching data. Uh, we cache queries, uh, cache view snippets. Uh, that's it's really easy to do. Um, monitoring an infrastructure, I probably can't stress enough that uh, you, you do need some uh, some way of looking at the overall health of your system. So uh, you know, I won't be talking about. Uh, I don't know. Here, here's just a few approaches that uh, uh, that, that we use. Uh, we started with Monit, and our systems folks uh, have kind of gravitated uh, towards uh, using Runit. And so it's just uh, another tool that can monitor a process, uh, look for it being errant in terms of memory usage, or it not being started and actually started up for you. It's great to have graphs of the state of your system. So we use Munin, and it has a lot of great plugins, uh, or just out of the box, we'll monitor a lot of things about your system. Uh, and 
you'll have different thresholds for seeing kind of where the state of your system should be and maybe after you deploy you take a look at the muni graphs and go oh for some reason our processes or our forks are spiking why is that we should investigate that we also do uh, infrastructure validation and it was uh, an interesting uh, exercise that uh, one of our systems guys did. He actually wrote a whole set of infra infrastructure validations using Cucumber. Uh, so it will check for things like, uh, is MySQL running? Is MySQL slave running? How far behind uh, is your MySQL slave? Five minutes is probably okay, but you know, if it gets to an hour behind, somebody should probably check as to why the, why the slave is behind. Is memcache running? Uh, and so however you want to do that, uh, it's nice to be able to know what's going on and uh, continuously run those validations to know that everything's are operating uh, normally. We had this bite us in the ass uh, Tuesday of this week. So the machine that we have uh, running Redis, Memcache, and our mail server uh, shit the bed. And all of our applications, uh, instead of using a name service like Redis.internal, whatever, uh, we were uh, exposing the, the machine name directly. So moving to uh, a name services approach where you have internal DF, DNS names to point to those services uh, just help, helps us now in that if a machine goes down, we can retarget uh, the service to another machine. And then uh, anything worth doing once is probably worth doing a second time. So when they built the Death Star, they didn't build one, they built two. Uh, so if you have the ability to, uh, to have a backup infrastructure, uh, that is great. Uh, let's see. Does anybody follow StarCraft II and kind of the, the BarCraft? Okay, so not many people here uh, had a little treat uh, for the Ruby Midwest folks. So we've got MLG Providence, which is our uh, Pro Circuit event that, that we run throughout the year, and uh, the big finals are coming up in three weeks, two weeks, uh, middle of November. So the first 25 ats with uh, that, I will give you an HD code to watch the streams for free. You can watch uh, competitive StarCraft, uh, competitive Halo. It's actually really interesting. Uh, I didn't think that it was going to be uh, that compelling, but it's just fascinating that uh, um, you know these guys make a living playing video games. And I think how much more time do I have for questions? So two minutes for questions. But thank you very much, and happy Ruby Midwest. Questions? Um, sizing wise, you talked about storage and how many players. How many simultaneous hits do you get on uh, a peak? Simultaneous, how many simultaneous hits do we get at peak? Uh, let's see, for the middleware platform now, I think we can handle eight or 9,000 requests a second. So far, uh, we probably have capacity that would far exceed uh, any kind of launch, uh, uh, you know, even for, an, even for an upcoming launch like Modern Warfare 3, uh, you know, I think we have enough capacity to do that. Probably on average we have maybe, I don't know, 200 to 500 requests a second internally that we're, that we're processing for, for game data. We talked a lot about Failures that let you learn. Mm -hmm. um, how did you? Maybe it's just a misperception, but it seems like there are a lot of failures, and you are working with other companies. So how, did, how do you handle that? And like, was that or was that just not a very big 
part of the big picture. Like we're just hearing about the bad stuff, but there's lots of other good stuff. I guess, okay, so uh, the question is, I, I talked about a lot of, of failures. Um, I guess uh, to go back to uh, what Joe had talked about earlier is that I always have a positive spin on, on what we can learn from those. So, you know, we failed uh, initially in uh, just, we didn't have enough capacity to, to handle the, the data. And then we learned from that to, uh, you know, not have crazy town to actually process all the game data. And we got smart about how we could do that in uh, like a queued fashion. Uh, so, so you just have a good relationship with the people? That's, that's when we look at the other companies? Is that oh, yeah, we definitely have a good relationship. I mean, if, if, we're not successful, then they're not successful. So uh, they they understood uh, by virtue of sending folks out <laughs> for two weeks to kind of oversee, like, are you doing the right thing? Yes, we're doing the right thing. <laughs> but you know, it over time we got to the point where it wasn't an issue uh, in terms of. Uh, handling the data or doing the, the integration, you know, they, they, they trusted us at that, at that point after, you know, the initial hiccups. <coughs> Anybody else? Can you speak to your hardware capacity and structure, how many machines it's all running on? Uh, yeah, I can, I can talk about the, really quickly, uh, for the past month, uh, as far as the NLG side of things, I, I was just doing a stack smashing. Uh, so we have all these uh, VMs running a rack space, probably over 100, and I took that down to two physical boxes. Uh, so physical hardware is great if you have the money to throw at that, and uh, we have the money to throw at that problem. So uh, so physical boxes are, are awesome. I think it's you know two 24 core machines, huge gigs of, of, of memory and, and space. So so we know our uh, I/O is going to be set. We we don't have to worry about kind of I/O contention and things like that. You know, I guess we still do if you know if an application is errant, but for the most part, that's that's kind of a, a non-issue for us. All right, I think that's it for the questions. Okay. Thank you very much, David.